The best telescope is the one you use the most, or so the saying goes. And at least in my case, it's very much true. In today's video, we are going to take a deeper look at a 10 inch flex tube dob from Skywatcher. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why it replaced my bigger 12 inch premium dob from Omegon. Hi, I'm Bogdan Damian and welcome to another video review. Founded in 1999 by its parent company Sinta, Skywatcher quickly became a very popular brand of astronomical equipment. You may have heard about Sinta before. That is because they are the parent company and manufacturer for Celestron products as well. One of Skywatcher's more popular lines of Topsonian telescopes is the FlexTube series. It consists of 13 different telescopes with manual and go-to functionality that come in seven different sizes, ranging from 5 to 16 inches of aperture. If you are like me and need to transport the telescope outside for every observing session, then in my opinion the sweet spot for a dob is around the 10 inch mark. Great light gathering capabilities, but still manageable in terms of size and weight. And coming from a 12 inch pro dub, I can tell you that with respect to this aspect, the difference is night and day. Not only is the whole telescope tube plus base light enough that I can take it outside in one piece, but the collapsible design reduces the length of the tube so much that it's significantly easier to manage and store. Even though the optical tube features an open design, it is still very sturdy and rigid, so that collimation is only necessary once every three or four observing sessions, which is almost on par with what the ProDub managed. With the exception for the open tube design, the flex tube is pretty similar to other Dobsonian telescopes. Same features, but also same reasonably good build quality. The only thing that is below average and borderline dangerous is the focuser. The housing, gearing and wheels are ok, nothing special and they work as intended. The parts I'm having problem with are the draw tube and the guiding mechanism on the inside of the focuser housing. The draw tube is made out of aluminum, soft aluminum, which means that the threads at the end can be easily damaged or even stripped. Every time I screw in an accessory like a spacer or a different 2 inch adapter, I have problems judging whether these are fully screwed in or if one more turn is possible. In my opinion, this makes it very imprecise and also dangerous because depending on the weight and angle, everything you attach to it can simply fall off with catastrophic consequences to your gear. Similarly, the bearings that guide the tube don't apply enough force to prevent the tube from creeping in over time if the load is above 1.5 kg or so, making focuser readjustments a frequent necessity. The focuser is also missing dual speed gearing for fine focusing. This would come in handy during high power observations. It's a bit sad that Skywatcher decided to skip this on their, let's face it, more expensive line of dubs. And because of all these aspects, I definitely recommend replacing the whole focuser assembly with a better one. There are options out there for around 100 and 120 bucks that are worlds apart from the stock one. Other than this, the telescope is fairly well built with everything being made out of metal. The struts are thick, rigid and very stable. They also feature two notches for two different length configurations. This is important when more back focus is necessary than the focuser can provide on its own, but more on this later in the video. The only aspect I don't like here is that pulling the two parts of the tube apart isn't that smooth, requiring me to apply quite a bit of force to get the top part of the tube sliding out. Loosening the friction screws doesn't really make a difference. But other than this, it's a nice and well thought out design. 
At the back there are three securing screws and three collimation thumb screws for the primary mirror. A fan for accelerated cooling isn't supplied here, but in my opinion it's not necessarily required for a 10 inch mirror. The cooling times here are acceptable even without a fan. The mirrors are made out of quality optical glass based on a borosilicate composition, which is then polished and coated with Skywatcher's proprietary radiant aluminum quartz solution, producing a respectable 94% reflectivity across the visible spectrum. The base is along the line of other Dobsonian mounts. It's made out of NDF boards that are well finished with no rough edges or glue residues like I had on the ProDub when I first got it. The securing handles also work for tightening or loosening the vertical movement of the optical tube and are okay. One aspect worth mentioning about the base is that it features a nice roller bearing that is fairly quiet and very smooth. I definitely prefer this over the one used on the ProDub's base, which in my opinion had a very loose movement with minimal friction. So with the exception of the focuser, the flex tube is very easy to use and is decently well built. In order to determine the optical performance of the flex tube, I've tested it over the last couple of months on nights with decent seeing conditions from my backyard under Bortle 4 skies. To eliminate any potential bottlenecks during my tests, I've paired the telescope with the 24mm pan optic and the 9mm D-Light both from Teleview. Also, since one of the reasons I've got the flex tube is its compatibility with Prismatic Bino viewers, I've also tested it together with the MaxBrite 2 Bino, including a set of 17.5mm Morpheus and 32mm quality Plözel eyepieces. I've also haven't used any shroud to cover the open space between the top and the bottom part of the optical tube, so the telescope was in its stock configuration during the tests. All right. So pointing the telescope at the Orion Nebula, I was greeted by some very bright views with lots of details. 250 mm of aperture can collect a great deal of light information. This is why contrast is also good, revealing some fine details on the outer arms of the nebula. Switching targets to the Pleiades painted a similar picture. Bright, contrasty views with a bit of blue tinted halos around the seven main stars thanks to the interstellar gas. Switching the target one more time, this time pointing the telescope at Jupiter and increasing the magnification to 266, using the Delight plus a 2x bellow revealed the gas giant in all its glory. So the views through the flex tube are as they should be coming from a large 10 inch light bucket. Quite good. But this being a Newtonian reflector also means that it's not all sunshine and rainbows. You see, the other aspects that usually accompany the views through a Newtonian reflector are also present here, such as chromatic aberrations that get accentuated as you move away from the center of the field of view towards the edges. This is especially visible when using low magnifications. Stars show up as elongated points of light or like tiny comets. Because of the obstruction caused by the secondary mirror, 25% by diameter and 6% by area, diffraction is also an issue, one that is responsible for reduced sharpness. Now I'm not saying that the views aren't sharp, they are, but anyone who looked through a refractor knows that a bit more sharpness is indeed possible. Before wrapping up this part of the video, I would like to go over one more aspect that ended up being one of the two reasons I got the flex tube in the first place. And this is the compatibility with Bino viewers. You see, in my opinion, one of the biggest upgrades one can apply to an astronomy setup is to facilitate observations with both eyes simultaneously. And this is made possible by using binoculars. viewers. I have a couple of videos on this topic if you want to find out more, but essentially these devices split the beam of light coming from the telescope into two separate ones, one for each eye. 
and this allows for a considerably more comfortable and natural viewing experience, which in turn allows for longer observing times when looking at a target. And this will give you more time to spot small differences and nuances that you would otherwise have missed. One big disadvantage of bino viewers, specifically prismatic bino viewers, is that they require a lot of back focus, and Newtonian reflectors are notoriously bad in this regard. Where a bino requires at least 11 to 12 centimeters of back focus, the standard Newtonian reflector will only allow for 3 to 5 centimeters. So you are either stuck with using magnifying lenses such as Berlows or glass path correctors, or you find a way to reduce the length of the optical tube of the telescope. And this is the area where the flex tube outshines every other Newtonian reflector on the market. Thanks to its telescopic design, you can adjust the length of the optical tube to accommodate for the extra back focus needed by a prismatic pino. And from my tests, this works extremely well. With a flex tube, I only need to slide down the top part of the tube containing the secondary mirror and focuser assembly to the second set of notches, and I'm all set for observing with both eyes simultaneously. And let me tell you, this is a game changer. Alright, now that we know what the flex tube's party piece is, it's time to see how it compares to other Dobsonian telescopes like the aforementioned 12 inch ProDub from Omegon. After all, it is the telescope it replaced. The first thing that is immediately obvious when putting both telescopes side by side is the overall size difference. The solid tube 12 inch dub is considerably larger and heavier than the 10 inch flex tube. And as mentioned earlier, this can have big implications when it comes to storage and transportation. While the 12 inch barely fits under the stairs where I keep my larger telescopes, you can see how much smaller and compact the flex tube is. Furthermore, Taking the telescope outside is much easier with a 10 inch flex tube than with a 12 inch ProDub. Since I don't like leaving my telescopes outside even in the shed because of moisture and high temperature variations between summer and winter, I have always preferred keeping them inside at room temperature. With the 12 inch dub, I always needed to carry the telescope outside in two pieces, first the base, then the tube. Now, with the smaller 10 inch, I have no trouble picking the telescope up, including the base, and carrying it outside in one go. As you probably guessed it by now, this is the second reason why I downsized. In terms of optical performance, both dubs are close. The 12 inch mirror does gather significantly more light, which is awesome for revealing fine details in faint DSOs. Contrast is also a tiny bit better on the ProDub since it has a closed tube design, which completely shields from polluting light getting inside. A light shroud on the flex tube should, however, fix this issue for the smaller dub. Sharpness is however basically identical between the two. Not only this, but the negative optical effects reflectors generally suffer from, such as a limited resolving power due to diffraction and off-axis imperfections like coma are present in both telescopes as well. While build quality is similar on both telescopes, the ProDub does have the better features. For example, the whole focuser assembly on the ProDub is way better than the Skywatchers. Also, the pivoting mechanism for the Y-axis is much smoother and more robust on the ProDub. The ProDub also comes with a quality 32mm Swan eyepiece and a fan for the primary mirror, while the flex tube has none of that. So in this department, just like with the light gathering capabilities, the ProDub is the undisputed winner. So even if the flex tube lacks the bells and whistles of a premium Dobsonian telescope and features a below average quality focuser, I still love it because it gets the basics right. The mirrors are well polished 
and the coating ensures a high reflectivity. Also the fact that it allows me to use a prismatic pine viewer without the need of a bellow or glass path corrector is something no other DAB in stock configuration can do. And as a by product, this also makes the telescope less bulky and easy to store and move around. And this fulfills exactly the need I had for a DAB. So for my use case, this is the perfect solution. Anyway, that's been it. I hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about the FlexTube series from Skywatcher and about Opsonian telescopes in general. I very much looking forward to reading your opinions in the comments down below. Thanks for watching and catch you guys in the next one.